Alright, so today's um, in-service training is going to be pretty much the same as what I did the last time with a uh, respiratory assessment and I'm going to, it's going to be like case-based or scenario-based and what I mean by that, it's going to be on the basis of a, a patient that is acutely short of breath uh, and then we'll, we'll focus on uh, basically an assessment from a nursing perspective with regards to a person that is now suddenly short of breath. Uh, I will be focusing on um, uh, some vitals, things that I want you to look at, and, and then a basic uh, clinical assessment from, from your side, from the nurses, uh, to look at potential things when you do your quick assessment of the patient whilst you're getting vitals and uh, formulating that you are now going to get hold of the uh, attending physician. Uh, so that you in your mind have an idea of what you think is also going on and in so doing you can communicate clearly to the attending physician the urgency of the, uh, of the matter. Okay, so that is absolutely vital. So the first thing is, so we have a patient that is uh, in a bed and suddenly uh, becomes short of breath. Now, the first thing is when that occurs, the first thing I'd like you guys, you, you guys are going to look at what is get their vitals uh, and get their saturations and you've also, but a lot of things that gets overlooked is the weight. Okay, and I've, I've made, you know that I have a major problem with uh, weight recording and the importance of a weight of a patient, particularly in a, in a hospital such as this. So, or any hospital for that matter. So, if a person comes in with a dry weight, it needs to be documented. And if you see the person is 80 kilograms on arrival, and suddenly is 96 kilograms after... The sort of, scale's not out. Uh, yeah. hmm? I said the scale's no, not out. No, no, the scale's not out. <laughs> so, you're going to... Why I say that's important? Because if someone's short of breath, and they, you see, geez, they came in at 80, they're now like 98 kilograms, uh, and you quickly sort of, I mean... You quickly look and look at their ankles and they're like this, or you look at the sacrum and you push and they've got edema. Uh, they're clearly fluid overloaded. So what is going to be the first thing to your mind about uh, a patient that is like, like that? What, I mean, what does anybody think is going to be? CHF. CHF, congestive heart failure, okay? So that's going to be your first, uh, your first marker. And then from there you're going to go, and what would you do to confirm that as CHF? Would you guys listen to the chest at yes. all? Mm -hmm. Yep. Or, hey, you don't just go, oh, call the doctor. No. <laughs> uh, hey? So you listen to the chest, right. And where, and where do you go partic Where do you go on the chest? Left lower. The lower lobes, eh? Left lower? Uh, left or, yeah, it doesn't matter, left or right. You, you have to do both. Eh? <clears throat> you can't just do yeah. one side because it's a comparison. So if you're good on just on one side, and you hear crackles there, and nothing in good ear entry on the other side, what's it going to be likely to be? If you just hear crackles on one side, not on the other. Pneumonia. And pneumonia more likely, hey? So, 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 so in the presence of an increased weight, you've got crackles by basally, uh, it's, it's going to be likely congestive cardiac failure. This would be important with someone with a history of heart disease, someone with renal disease, and someone that's got been given like 400 liters of fluid. Okay. Now, if you hear crackles in the basis, how do you distinguish between atelectasis in a post-surgical patient versus congestive cardiac failure? What do you make the patient do? Deep breathing. Coughing. Not, not so much the deep breathing, but coughing. Because you need that sudden diaphragmatic excursion to try pop up those, uh, those bases of the line. And what happens to the crackles after they cough in eggs like this? Is? They go away. They go away. So important to know and to be able to distinguish that. In a patient that's post-surgical that has atelectasis, what is the problem with that in a surgical patient? What are they at risk for with atelectasis? Hmm? No. Pneumonia. Pneumonia, pneumonia, pneumonia. When does that complication kick in with the hypoxia and the shortness of breath after surgery? Straight afterwards? No. 24 hours afterwards? 72 hours afterwards? 
72 hours after surgery is when the pneumonia kicks in. Oh, and pneumonia. The pneumonia, okay? So, I, again, that's important, it, particularly for your surgical patients, hey? Day three post-surgery, and this has happened like, several times here, yeah? uh, acutely sh short of breath, given 600 liters of fluid, and now short of breath. So, it, if, you, if it's like 24 hours, most likely fluid overload, 72 hours, probably atelectasis, and underlying pneumonia. Okay. So that's those two those two patients. Now we get into so you go and you listen, go see the patient, weight is fine. There's no difference in the weight. They're acutely short of breath. You listen to the bases and you feel that geez, you know, air entry is good on one side, air entry on the other side. Can't really hear anything. Okay, so you can't hear, so you can put that. You've got air entry on that side. The patient's clearly distressed. Listen to the other side, and you can't hear anything with your stethoscope. That's so funny. what then? What are the potential issues there? Collapsed lung. Collapsed lung. Yeah. What else? Pleural effusion. Pleural effusion. Yes. Pleural effusion. Collapsed lung. Pneumo. Hmm? Like a pneumo? Pneumothorax. Mm -hmm. Okay. You were waiting for me to say that again, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you got the, I'm going to just work with, we'll just work with those, the, those three things, okay? How do we distinguish between those three things? Okay, so if we say the patient, so in a. Uh, not, yeah, chest x-ray, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> in, in a, so then you think, just, okay, can't hear something on the one side. Then you look at your patient type. Hey, who have you got? Who have you got sitting and lying in this bed? Is it an asthmatic? Is it a COPD patient? Uh, is it a person that has a malignancy? Is it a person that has a pneumonia? Uh, is it a patient that's got chronic bronchitis with a lot of sputum? Is it a patient that's got bowel obstruction? I mean, what do I have here? Okay. So, in your asthmatics and your uh, COPD patients, you have bulla, bullous formation, which are basically sacs of useless lung, and they can pop, particularly if they're distressed, okay? And if you get a pneumothorax and a popped lung, what are you going to, you hear no entry on the one side, like you said, you've gone short of breath, there goes puffing and puffing and puffing again. And distress, you listen here, you listen, you can't get any of this out. So, with a pneumothorax, how are you going to distinguish between a pleural effusion, collapsed lung, or a pneumothorax? What, what, what thing was going to help you? Where are you going to go next? So, you're going to look, you're going to say, Whoo! So, you just go straight here to the track here. Okay? Mm -hmm. I want you to do this often on normal patients. To kind of get a feel that the trachea kind of hangs to the right. If you, if you feel for the sternum manubrial, sternum manubrium here, can you feel the angle here, the sternum manubrial angle? There's your two clavicles, it's right in the middle there. And you put your middle zap finger in there, and you feel with these two. So you go like this, and you feel for whether you can push your fingers in between the, the trachea to get a sense that it should be slightly towards the right. And you should be able to fit your finger on either side pretty easy, but more so on the left than on the right. Okay, but well you need to practice on someone else, eh? You need to practice on someone else. The thing is, in a pleural effusion, which way do you think it's going to deviate? Towards it? A pleural a pneumothorax. Towards the pneumothorax or away from the pneumothorax? Away. Away, exactly. So you're going to know. Okay? For a collapsed lung from either a mucus plug or an aspiration, or a foreign body, for whatever that matter, which way is the track you're going to go? Towards it. Towards it, exactly. Okay. And in a pleural effusion, a massive pleural effusion, which way is it going to go? Away. 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 So it goes the same way as the pneumothorax. Okay. So then, how do you distinguish between pleural effusion and a pneumothorax? Thanks, <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can look at an extra, yeah, but with a pneumothorax. No, not, not, not for a massive one. They're gonna, remember, they're going to be distressed, eh? So, I mean, if, if you're seeing someone that's now really going short of breath and you're thinking, geez, what's going on here? There's been a precipitous decline and you listen to the chest and you can hear there's no entry on the one side. Um, there are, th there is another way that you can basically do it is, is, you, can, is you can tap. Now this is something docs do, okay? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of, yeah. So, so I mean, the um, the typically, if you get them seated, seating, sitting upwards with a massive pleural effusion, you're going to see the trachea is deviated away, and you're going to not hear anything, not going to hear anything, not going to hear anything. Not, but by the time you get to the apices, which is right here at the top or into the supraclavicular fossa, you should hear some breath sounds and you should also hear, you may even hear like some sort of like this bronchial breathing, which is kind of like a, it just, it, it just means that the inspiratory portion and the, when they're breathing in and out, it's the same length. You just hear this, it's, it's, if you drew a line, you would say inspiratory, expiratory is the same time distance. In fact, if you put your stethoscope on your trachea and you breathe, that's bronchial breathing. So, if you hear what it sounds on the trachea here on the lung, that's bronchial breathing, and it'll give you an idea. But essentially, you can literally just go like this and tap it, tap the chest. If it's a big pleural effusion, you're going to see that's going to be like dull, as in like thought, like concrete or be dull. And I'm not asking you to do it, I just think you need to just know. I mean, by the stage that you know that the trachea is deviated, you've got a COPD or an asthmatic, the thing that you've got to worry about is a tension pneumothorax. So that would tell, you would tell the doc, listen, acutely distressed, I think it's a tension, the trachea is deviated, you need to come right now. Okay? This would be important if someone comes to the floor with a central line in. So we put a central line in in theater, and they will come to the floor, a post-op, because they're not going to go to ICU anymore. They're going to come to the floor, and uh, you're going to come, and suddenly you see, geez, they're suddenly getting... Short breath, short breath, short breath, and you're going to feel the trachea, and you're going to say, oh my goodness, it's going well. Well, they've got a pneumothorax from, from the CPP being put in. Okay? And then, so those are the two, those are the two things that would be towards, or if it's towards, what are you going to hear? No air entry sound towards, you're going to put your step, you're not going to hear anything, it's collapsed lung, that's also an emergency. Okay? That also typically happens in your asthmatics, your COPD patients, and people that aspirate. Okay, so next thing, we get there, the patient's short of breath. So we do the weight, the weight's fine. We listen to the lungs, the lungs are fine. What else could it be? PE. PE, right. Now, PE, what are you going to, is there anything clinically that you could say that it's a possible PE? I'll give you one way or the other. Being on inspiration? No, they can get pleuritic chest pain, but that's not that's not specific. Okay, so with a PE, this is the problem with it. Even clinicians struggle with it. A PE can be like a thief in the night. Hey, eh? you don't. They're just short of breath, and you listen to the chest, and it's clear. You look at their sats. Their sats may be fine. Okay, if they're low, that helps you because you think there's a problem with oxygen exchange there. Um, Blood pressure at the PE, up or down? Depends on the size of it. Eh? So the, the point here is there's no particular clinical sign that will help you to say yes it is or no it isn't. It's literally, you're going to say it's an inpatient, it's a risk factor. Risk, risk factor. <laughs> you can do chest x-ray and there are signs on a chest x-ray to help you, but not easy to see. Okay. And the same thing is for an ECG, which you don't need to worry about, but a normal ECG does not mean there's no PE. Normal vitals does not mean there's no PE. So essentially what I'm trying to get across here, short of breath, patient, clinical examination is completely normal from a respiratory assessment, it's fine in this. Okay. That also is an emergency. Okay. Um, then we get into... Uh, so... We then have a patient that, so you have a shortness of breath, 
patient, you osteoevaluate a patient, you go see short of the complaint of being short of breath, you do, the, you do their uh, vitals, that's fine, sats are fine, weight is fine, clinically they're, uh, they cannot find good air entry bilaterally, the trachea is nice and central, you know, you don't think there's any issue, they don't have any other concerns. PE is, uh, they're on Daltaparin 4000 every day, so they've been given DVT prophylaxis, and they are batting along and short of breath. What else could it be? Cancer? No, I'm just asking mechanisms. Uh, mechanisms. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so mechanisms. I, I, I'm just talking mechanisms. Um, Mm, drug reaction, that's a, that's a good, but you'll hear wheezing and all those things. It's just, you know, so wheezing is obviously a sign of either a, a, a bronchoconstriction, asthma, asthmatic attack. So is it recurrence of the asthma, COPD, or whatever. But now they're, they're completely clear. Um, what else causes people to, hide, to breathe fast? Anxiety. Hmm? Anxiety. Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. But before that, before before you get to <coughs> the being anxious, they're, they're batting along. And they're just they're breathing, breathing, like breathing. Allergy, they're breathing. septic. Hmm? They're septic. Why, why do they breathe like that? They're trying to offload CO2. Why? Sorry? CO2. Why? Because I don't like being put on the spot. Sorry? Why do they want to offload CO2? Because they, you can't live off CO2. Why, why, why do you, why are you, you're right, but why? What do you mean why? Why are they blowing the CO2 off? Because they're compensating. For what? For... Why are they blowing the CO2 off? Um, metabolic acidosis. Absolutely. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. <laughs> so, and that is something that anybody that has a metabolic acidosis in order to keep their pH normal are they going to hyperventilate to blow the CO2 off hmm. so before we start telling people are oh, anxious and nuts and all the rest of it just consider that you've got all these things is this a metabolic acidosis particularly our diabetic patients particularly if they've come off a DKA infusion that's running on the board you can see what's going to happen here shortly don't you so, um, so for a DKA infusion, so that's where you stop that you give the subcute insulin, you're starting them on the nor, the insulin infusion is coming off, and you see two to three hours later they're starting to hyperventilate, complaining of abdominal pain. Well, guess what? They have a metabolic acidosis reoccurring and hyperventilate. So don't ever discount that, and that can become from acid for ODs. Um, etc okay so shortness of breath or the perception of shortness of breath has many many different causes okay I just all I need from a nursing aspect is you guys to appreciate the pathophysiology of what's going on I'm not asking you to make a diagnosis I'm just asking you to appreciate the situation so that your own clinical skills are enhanced and that when you communicate to the attending physician that it comes across like holy mackerel this nurse knows what they're doing I better come and check it out do not be fearful for being wrong you know what I mean don't be scared of being wrong okay because all it means is that you're thinking of what you're doing and that's all I want is I want you to be processing the information in front of you so that you can deliver good care to the patients because you know them better than we do okay and then communicate that across. So as long as you know, remember the steps. You look at the weight in terms of vitals in particular. We all know blood pressure. We all know saturations. We all know that. The weight is important to guide you on what's going on. What type of patient. You listen to the bases of the lungs to see if you've got equal entry by basally. Okay. You then assess the track here. And if all that is clear, you still can't find anything. PE. Are they on DVT prophylaxis? Yes or no? If that's all fine, make sure that you're considering is this potentially metabolic from drugs, medications, renal failure, all those things, DKA and what have you. 
And if that's all okay, if you think it's okay and it's an anxiety thing, you could still say, well, probably anxious, but I need it in your second opinion. There's nothing wrong with doing the saying, listen, could you please come and see this patient? Okay? All right. Do you guys do um, any sort of training to take airways with the dogs? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nope. So if I say to you, we're going to intubate someone in the ward? We run. Run. Yeah. Run. Yeah. Run. Yeah. Run. 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 Okay, so because I, I I really need because we we need to get because you'll find that once you get these kind of things doing, yeah, your level of angst dealing with really sick people it will go down. Okay. Does it, Callan? Hmm? I said, does it, Callan? She was a med surge, went to ICU. Does it? The more knowledge you get, yeah. Of course it is. Yeah, okay. it's yeah, it does. As long as you see it and you, and you, so that's what I want. And I just want the initial assessments. You know, when you're assessing the patient on the side of the bed, and you say, "Oh, doc, I think it's pneumonia." I'll say, "Oh, why do you think that?" This, this, and this. I'll say, oh, "Okay, let me go look myself." Oh, I think you're right. Well, I don't <laughs> consider this, or you know, you know what I mean? That's what I want. Yeah, that's what. That, that's essentially what I want. Okay. Um, because also, if you feel mm, well, this person's wrist rate's going up a little, and you know, mm, you can start doing the assessment, listening to those lungs and seeing how they're going and checking the weight. So in that way, you're really going to pick up when the patient's five liters overweight from their dry weight, and you can really intervene as a nurse and say, "Listen, like, you're five kilos up. Stop giving this person IV fluids, normal saline, at 150, 200 mils an hour for seven days." There's third, third space, and you're going to avoid. You're going to pick up all those things because you know they're going to cause certain problems. So you you see the importance of weight taking daily weights, for instance. You see the importance of people with COPD and asthma to get their things all regular. And if they suddenly go off, then you know pneumothorax, plug, mucus plug. You know. Okay. Any questions? Do you prefer daily weights over ins and outs? Because sometimes we have ins and outs, but they're really just ins but not outs. Do you, you know what I would, yeah. <laughs> I would? I would tell you that I would tell you, ins and outs are are just trying to work out what your fluid balance is, which essentially is what your daily weights will be. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you are 80 kilograms dry on arrival. Dry weight, you don't have congestive cardiac failure, preoperative, and now you're suddenly 85 kilos or 87 kilograms. Well, if you did all the ins and outs, you'll be seven liters plus. Mm -hmm. So it's just a good way of getting uh, getting to that position. Yeah, so at least that. a weight is accurate. <clears throat> Half the time they're on the bathroom doing them their own thing, doing yeah. their own thing, Mr. Gadget. Ins and outs so is really, really ICU. To just see where they, what they're getting in, what they're getting out, because you're really monitoring what their fluid oh, yeah. shifts, because yeah. those small fluid shifts can push a patient anyway in ICU. So, and we're really trying to run them a little dry on the drier side, not the wet side of things. Right. Okay. Uh, so just to be mindful of of weights as being a very important tool to avoid problems. I don't want to see plus 25 here. Yeah? So, I'm sorry, again. Um, so if they're on ins and outs, they should also be on daily weights. No, if they want ins and outs, just say, can I do a daily weight, please? Because yeah. sometimes we just find people are poor historians with that. Mm -hmm. No, uh, ins and outs, unless you're in ICU, it's very difficult to do on the ward. Because patients disappear, do something else, mm -hmm. forget they did that, forget they did that. Mm -hmm. It gets all finicky. And just check what their weights are, you know? Um, we just line them all up in the morning. And I'm like, why don't we just get the feet of them all if they're in the surreal city? Yeah, yeah, yeah and, I think, and that's what I would want. That's what I would want. Just really, you have a way in, you know? You, or all the beds have scales. I get when you see that. Yeah, so you just as long as you know that your weight and you know the patient's running well, we're on track, you know, they're, 
they're uh, they dry weight or they're putting on weight appropriately if you like if you say someone like uh, Mr. Sharon Charles or something like that you know you want to see a gradual increase in their weight um, but you don't want to see this explosive like suddenly they're 10 kilograms heavier than they were particularly your post-surgical patients because they get third spacing and then the wounds dehiss and then they get abscess they get fluid collections in the abdomen they get an abscess they got bowels get a dermatist they fall apart you know they end up in ICU yeah all I want is to have clinical skills increased okay on the nursing side of things when you assess your patients and, and try not to do too much of the, I very, very worry about that. What's that? Well, the whole thing that nursing has become, is no longer more, it's, I don't know how much time oh, yeah. you spend in entering data. Way too much. Way too much. Hmm? Too Way much. too much. Yeah, data and, pay, and not actually caring for your patient, which is what you, that's your primary job. Yeah. No, you didn't. You didn't take up nursing to become a data capturer. <laughs> okay, so I mean that is a, a major, major, major problem. And I, I am going to do. We're going to do audits on that. So don't, don't feel. I'm going to be extreme. I'm going to ask them to come and explain to me how it makes it better for patient care if the nurse is spending 75% of her time entering crap into the PC than actually dispensing medications, treating patients' needs, actually evaluating them. Uh, okay, so, yeah, so just try, I want you to get your clinical skills, hopefully have some time in the day to try and practice. And tr the whole track your thing just needs practice. You need to appreciate and listen to lungs as much as you can. So your patient, listen to the basis and go through the steps that I've just discussed every time. Just do it, just as a matter of like routine. So that your mind's there, your mind's there, your mind's there. Okay, that's fine. Call the doc. I think it's that. We want to get patient. Okay. Good. Anything else? Nothing.